You want to go ahead? All right, I'd like to welcome everyone. Happy Open Ed Week. And we are very happy to have all of you here to join us for our um, first webinar for Open Ed Week. And um, today we're going to talk about OER basics. And I think you'll really enjoy hearing from our speaker today, who is a librarian at Fox Valley Community College. And if you could all go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat, that would be great to see who's here today with us. All right. Um, so the agenda today will have some introductions and we're going to talk about, like I said, the basics, the what, why, and how of OER, and also some upcoming events that we think you'll be interested in. There are so many events this week that <laughs> hardly enough time to attend them all. Luckily, they're being recorded for the most part. But um, before I introduce Val, um, oh, well, I'll do the introductions first and I'll turn it over to Una so she can talk a little bit about Open Ed Week. Um, my name is Sue Tajan and I am the coordinator for instructional technology at Northern Essex Community College in Haverhill, Massachusetts. We're about 20 miles north of Boston on the East Coast. So it's snowy and cold here still. And I'm also the um, serve on the executive council of CCCOER as the co-president with Lisa Young from Scottsdale Community College. And Valerie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. My name is Valerie Magno, and I am a librarian at the Fox Valley Technical College, which is in Wisconsin. All right. Thank you, Val. So, Una, would you like to talk a little bit about Open Ed Week? Would this be a good spot? Great. Yeah, thank you, Sue. And thank you, Sue and Val, for um, members of our community and our exec council, in Sue's case, for um, presenting this uh, today. And I, this is the eighth year of Open Ed Week. Um, so it, our first one was back in 2013. And so I don't know how many of you are repeat uh, Open Ed Week uh, attenders and promoters, um, or if this is your first year, but uh, it continues to grow each year um, and get more diverse in countries and languages. Um, so that is really exciting. And I just wanted to give you a little highlight as of this weekend. Um, there were um, total contributions of 235 uh, spanning um, 27 countries um, and 11 languages. And um, I won't do the 27 countries, but I'll tell you the 11 languages just for fun. Catalan, Croatian, Dutch, English, French, German, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Slovenian, and Spanish. And I shouldn't say this, but we are still accepting <laughs> informally open ed week contributions. So that number is likely to grow by the end of the week. So um, I, I hope that um, you are attending additional events besides this great one today. Um, I, I went to one earlier, uh, just a few hours ago um, out of Oregon that was just outstanding. Um, so do go to um, the openeducationweek.org website. Uh, and uh, check all of that out if you haven't had a chance to. And I do wanna just mention one thing, and I know Liz will, will probably drop a few links for us. The one thing that's different this year is there's an opportunity to dialogue um, directly uh, with uh, peers in open education and contributors uh, using our OEG Connect platform. Um, and you can sign up for that if you um, haven't uh, previously, and you can join the conversation. So thank you very much, Sue, for, for giving me that opportunity. All right, thank you, Una. And if you are not familiar with um, CCCOER, the Community College Consortium for Open Edu Educational Resources, um, CCCOER is an organization that is, I think, in its 13th year now, but correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, Una and Liz. Um, that seeks to expand awareness and access to high quality open educational resources, um, support faculty and their choice and development 
foster collaboration between community colleges and um, institutions across the country. And the bottom line is really to improve student equity and success. And um, Northern Essex has been a member of CCC OER since 2015. And they really helped us in Massachusetts um, get started with our individual institute um, initiatives at our colleges, as well as our statewide um, initiative for OER in Massachusetts. So it's been like an amazing organization to be involved in. All right, and here's a quick view of our membership. Um, we have 90 members in 34 states you can see dispersed across the country and we have 16 system-wide memberships. And now I'm going to turn it over to Val and she is going to get started with her OER basics, um, introduction to OER. Thank you, Val. Um, unmute myself, let's see. Today, I want to talk to you about Open Educational Resources, or OER, and how OER can be used to lower the cost barrier for students. Here's my library guide that I use for faculty when I'm giving presentations. And when I do anything about copyright, I always have a disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer and this guide is not a substitute for legal advice. So that said, I'm going to talk to you today about what I understand about open educational resources. Copyright is basically when you put anything into tangible form, original content into tangible form, it is automatically covered by copyright. And that gives you the right to make copies and change it and modify it. And sometimes this becomes a problem when teachers want to use materials because they have to get permission or they have to pay for access and same way for the students for textbooks. So there's a big push, there has been for a couple of decades now, to try to get free textbooks for students. And what the Creative Commons license does is it adds an addendum to the copyright. It allows the author of the, the work that, I'm, I mean the copyright owner of the work, which isn't always the author, to give away some of the rights that they get automatically. How open an item is depends on the author or the copyright owner. They can decide how open they want the material to be. But ideally, the open educational resource gives the person, teacher, student, faculty, the ability to make their own copies, keep them on their own database, share them in many ways online in their course content program, and in particular, adapt, modify, and improve. Some people get very brave and they remix things together. And there's also the important component of being able to share what you do with others. And this makes it so that if you find a perhaps a textbook that you like, but there's a couple of examples in there that are outdated, then you can just Go ahead and update the textbook yourself, publish it as a new version, and then you can use it for your, that textbook for your classroom. One of the ways that the open educational resources are really exciting is because of these five R's. The flexibility that you get from being able to edit and change immediately instead of waiting for a publisher to get around to it or arguing with them about what needs to be changed. Once you have a free open textbook, you can just change it to match your, your teaching objectives or your out objectives to, that you're trying to match to core requirements. And you can use relevant examples in your course that will bring information to your students in a more personal way. 
text you can use. You can choose a textbook. You can add in your own relevant examples. And you can make sure that the textbook you have for your student is up to date. Accessibility is another issue. I don't know how many times we've had students call in the first couple of weeks and ask if the library has a textbook. And we have to say, well, we, we have very few textbooks, just the ones that the teachers have loaned us to give out it to our intervals. For the most part, students just have to wait, or if their teacher has an open educational textbook, a free textbook, they can have their textbook the first day of class, even before the first day of class. And even better, they're not just renting the textbook for a semester, that textbook will be available to them even after they're through with the class. And that brings me to affordability. A lot of students are just barely making it. They're just barely scraping up enough money to take classes and they're tired of going in debt. And then you put the pandemic on top of that and a lot of students have just given up, which is really sad because this is when we really need to be taking the time and energy to educate our students. With an open educational textbook that's free, you lower the cost barrier for those students that are struggling so that they can have a free textbook and the reason this is so important is because research has shown that students that try to get through a class without a textbook just don't do as well as the students that have a textbook available now i know some faculty have said well you know even if the students have the textbook they don't always use it and that's true but they should have the option and the choice to go to the textbook if they want to. And we can provide that option, a free textbook for classes. Many, many schools, many universities and colleges already are providing these free textbooks. And so you can tell when a college uses the same textbook year to year that the students are learning what they need to learn. And these are authoritative textbooks. They're peer reviewed in some cases. And they come from resources like British, um, the British campus textbooks are well known, OpenStax. There's a, a lot of great textbooks out there. And there are some topics that don't have a whole textbook. And in that case, teachers can do modules where they take a chapter here and a chapter there and either remix it into a textbook or just teach a class without a textbook and have modules for each concept. And I really try to emphasize that it's important to teach the concept, not the content, because then if the content gets old, you're not teaching something that's 10 years old. You can go out there, find the most current content to match your concepts. So increased affordability is a huge, important way we can help students. And I like this image I got from Hawaii uh, Library that talks through what you might consider if you're going to go into getting an OER. And now let me just mention about how to uh, use the OER. OER is very flexible but they are pretty strict about one thing, and that's giving an attribution to the creator. And that is just a matter of courtesy. You can see I have a library guide on attribution best practices. I'll just click there. And the main thing you need to do to use any kind of open educational resource is to use the TASL. The very minimum is to put in the title, author, source that you got it from and the license. That's bare minimum. But what I would like to ask people to do is to add version information. Although it's really great that there's a lot of flexibility with OER, that means you can find a textbook, update it, but now you have a new version. And it's really important to put that version information in there so that the next person knows which copy, uh, edited copy they have of that textbook. So I'm just asking you to consider putting in extra version information that you can find and make it easy so that if students want to cite a chapter or a paragraph from that open educational resource that they don't have to dig 
you know, spend all their time digging up the information. Just put it in the attribution and save them some time. The other thing I have on my library guide is a template that you could use for the TASL compared to the citation information that's needed. Again, the only thing that's really different is there's extra information about the version of the textbook or chapter. And I have gone through and showed examples in APA and MLA. So getting back to this main guide, those links are up here the attribution best practices, example attribution. And while we're on that, I also want to mention accessibility. A lot of the benefit of these textbooks is they come in many forms. You often have HTML, EPUB, PDF, and the option to print it out. Another thing that we need to consider though is whether it's in a PDF or a PowerPoint, Word document or web page, it needs to be accessible. And that means that your images should have alt text so that if somebody's using a screen reader, they know what that image is about. And that's where I'm going to try to uh, encourage you to add a wave extension to your Chrome or Firefox. And I will do a live demo here of what WAVE does. WAVE goes in and it checks for obvious problems with your, your accessibility. And I can see right here that my image has the alt text missing. Well, that's an easy fix. I can go in and fix that and bring my errors down to zero. And I have asked all my vendors and all my web pages that I edit, I make sure that they can pass a wave audit so that I have zero edits and zero contrasts. That doesn't errors. That doesn't mean that it's perfect. Accessibility, usability, that's always an ongoing process. It keeps changing, but at least with the wave tool, you can have a baseline. And if you can get zero errors at the top, at least you know you've you've can go on to the next page and get it up to spec. Once you have all your pages up to spec, then you can go to the next level and keep adding features. But I highly recommend the wave tool to get information. You can click on this link and I talk more about it and how to find it. So back to my guide here. So attribution best practices, an example attribution is available and promoting wave for web design. Once you have your content, well, first of all, you, you need to figure out what your concept is that you're trying to teach. And so you define your concept and then you try to find it. Once, and I'll go through some finding aids. Once you find it, then you're going to be able to adapt it to your learning objectives, align it with your core requirements and then use it and have flexibility. So you might be asking, how can I find it? Well, finding OERs is a lot like looking in any other database, whether you're looking for articles in an EBSCO database, or if you're looking for textbooks in the OER Commons. You're going to start with a broad search and then narrow it down. I have actually a guide with a bunch of links per topic that I've been collecting. And on the first page, I have some of my favorite OER finders and open textbook sites. LibreText is an excellent group of textbooks. OER Commons is one of the most common places that I start when I'm doing a search. So if I put in something like business and I do a search, this gives me the opportunity to choose the education level and then I can go into media format or material type. In material type, you scroll down and you can click textbook and this pulls up a number of textbooks that could be used in a lower division or community college. You can then click on one of these. It gives you information about the resource who endorses it, who's using it. It tells you about the licensing information. And then you can click on the view source to get to the source to see it further. So an example like this, 
what I would end up doing is I'd go into the read book and contents, and that will let me look closely at whether this book is going to meet my need. Now, at this point, it's in OER Commons. To get out of OER Commons, you can just open, and so you just right click. Uh, let's see, no, I guess you can just, yeah, right click, open in a new tab. And when you open it in the new tab, you're going to be in the actual work itself. So OER Commons is a great way to find things, but when I'm actually linking to them, I go into the resource itself. And that OER Commons, I have an example screenshot of doing a search just to get you to see where, uh, here's the subject area that you choose, and then it puts up the different tags that you can then add or subtract. Merlot is another excellent resource for searching. And what these are is collections of bookmarks. So a faculty member that has a, a, uh, a user account in Merlot, they put their bookmarks to their favorite resources. And looking at other people's resources can give you an idea of what they have found. It's, it's kind of like peer review because they liked it enough to put it into their bookmarks. You do have to check to make sure if it is OER because not everything in Merlot is OER. It's, but that doesn't mean you can't use it. You just have to use it as a copyrighted material instead of an open education resource. Another thing that I really like to use is Skills Commons. And Skills Commons is really good for those things that aren't as easy to find uh, in other ways. So for example, if you went into welding, you might not find anything on OpenStax about welding, but Skills Commons has a lot of materials for people that are trying to teach welding. I use that when I'm running into kind of a dead end with just a plain textbook for a class. I can go there to get alternative resources. I feel like I went a bit fast on that, but does anybody have any questions? There are no questions in the chat as of now, Val. You can get back to me later. Uh, I'll put my email address in the chat. And I'll be sharing handouts and slides and that will have links that you can go back and look through my library guide. Feel free to, to borrow. And the idea with being a librarian is to collect the best information and share it as widely as you can. So thank you for listening and please feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions or suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Um, so we have a handout for you that was dropped in the chat and these slides will be available through the CCC OER website. Um, and you can contact Val, you know, right here is her email address and there is, are her library resources, which are great. I already bookmarked them while you were talking. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so there are more opportunities to get involved in the spring. Um, CCC OER has a host of webinars that have been put together by the professional development um, committee, the next webinar. So of course this week is Open Ed Week and um, visit their website or click on the link um, so you can see all of the events that are happening this week. And then um, on April 14th, there's a webinar on the K through 12 and community college collaboration, May 12th, finding professional development resources for OER adoption and creation, which should be pretty interesting. And then on June 9th, um, we have not determined the topic yet, but we'll pull the members and see what people are most interested in for that webinar. So we have webinars in both the fall and the spring um, that are free for anyone to attend and, and so are I also, just... oh, go ahead. Oh, go sorry. ahead, just before you move to your next slide, I saw somebody getting ready to click to the next slide. I did want to say tomorrow we have a webinar at the same time as this one, and it's on our regional leaders of open education initiative. Um, and so, um, oh, <laughs> sorry. <There it> <laughs>
I was pre-announcing. Um, and we're entering phase two on that one. So we had a lot of, um, I hope, uh, participants today, but a lot of our members and a lot of our community join us for that um, that initiative over the last year and a half almost. Um, and it's really looking at statewide leadership and, and system-wide leadership and um, having folks collaborate across boundaries um, for leading their open education um, projects and sustaining them over time. And so we're moving into a more uh, of a network um, phase um, where there'll be more formal uh, training for those leaders and um, helping them to develop and implement strategic plans at their institutions or organizations. So, thank you. Thanks, Una. And on Wednesday, um, I'd like to give a plug for this webinar and it will be um, at noon Eastern time. So usually they're at three o'clock um, Eastern time, 12 o'clock Pacific, but this one will be at noon. And um, it's a web, it's a going to be a student panel discussion with the Massachusetts um, Student Advisory Council and the Assistant Commissioner of the um, Massachusetts Department of Higher Ed. And we're gonna talk about how the students really um, spurred the OER statewide effort in Massachusetts. So it should be interesting. The students are really excited about it. And then on Thursday, um, there'll be an event around open pedagogy and equity. And Friday, um, global and CCC OER leadership opportunities. And I don't know if those are live webinars or events that are through OE Global Connect. Um, Sue, the, yeah, thank you for asking. Those are actually going to be um, asynchronous events uh, through mm -hmm. OEG Connect. So they're gonna be discussions online. Um, and you, they've, um, they've already been started in the OEG Connect um, discussion space. So you can start those early if you want, but Thursday will be the, the focal, Thursday and Friday will be the focal time for those two topics. Thank you. All right. So definitely stay in the loop with us, keep in touch, um, bookmark the website, join our community email list that it's probably one of the most vibrant email lists that I've ever been involved in. If you have a question, you're looking for resources, you post it out on the email and you'll, you'll get five responses right away. <laughs> and people, you know, it's a great way to network and connect and learn and all different levels um, of OER, you know, experience out there. And the best thing about it is there are so many people on the list that, you know, you get different perspectives from across the country. And we also have a blog, um, an EDI blog and student OER impact stories on the website. So those are always interesting to read. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, any questions? We can open it up to Val for questions right now or post them in the chat, whatever you'd like. But thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Val, for sharing that awesome LibGuide. Um, there was a question in the chat a while back. Sophia Cook asked, what link do you share with the students and how? I'm not sure exactly what link she was talking about. I just share the library guide links as students ask questions. A lot of times in chat or email, they'll ask a question and I already have a guide that refers to it. And so I'll answer a little bit and then I'll say for more information, go to this guide and let me know if you have any questions after that. So for example, in this case for faculty, I would just send them Usually what happens is they sign up for a class, half of them show up, and even the ones that don't show up, I get the roster. So I email everybody after the presentation saying, thank you for being interested. And I give them a rundown of what I covered and the link to the library guide that they can use for reference. And Val, is, is that Thanks, for faculty? Well, I go into classrooms and talk to students about a lot of topics, but for OER, we've been just focusing on faculty at this point. I gotcha. Um, 
and, and people can they can un they can unmute uh, right Liz and go ahead and um, speak up and ask questions if they'd like to do it that way yes um, they can unmute themselves great thanks Liz um, so Val you know there's been more discussion recently about the difference between open access uh, as in you know uh, journals um, and um, and, you know, I'm thinking about subscriptions, which aren't actually open access necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, but they are um, free to students at an institution that holds a subscription. And it is confusing because of the term open. Open means different things in different contexts. So open access, you've got things that you can get to for free, and you've got things that are under copyright, and you can't like print them out and sell them but you can link to them. So that would be open access, that you can access them for free, you can link to them, and you don't have to worry about it. If it's under copyright, though, you have to be very careful not to upload it into your uh, Blackboard or your web page and say, hey, look at this material. And because you might be preventing the owner of that copyright material from making money off of it by publishing it and distributing it without their permission. So if it's just easy to get to for free, that doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want with it. With open educational resources, there has been specifically put a Creative Commons license or GNU that's also, but that's older, but they've put an addendum to the copyright that the, the copyright owner has preemptively given permission for someone to do certain things with their content so that they don't have to come back and ask for permission each time. So the ideal would be CC0. Uh, that's as close as you can get to public domain for as long as your content is under copyright law. The next level um, of open that we really like is the Creative Commons 4.0, which means that you have to do an attribution. But other than that, you can make copies, you can store it wherever you want, you can mix it, match it, you know, do whatever you want with it, as long as you attribute where you started from, you know, who, who the original author was. And there's a, there's a variety of ways that a person can open up the rights to copyright. They have on the Creative Commons license website, they have a, a little um, form you can fill in or, you know, just as electronic to figure out what kind of a license you want to use. If you want to make it open, everybody can do everything, but you don't want them to make money off of it. You can put in an NC uh, on the license so that it's non-commercial. If you put in an ND, a non uh, derivative though, you've taken it right out of the OER realm. It's no longer considered open educational resource because the whole point of the OER is that you can make derivatives and edit and change it and update it. Um, so did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, Because open access doesn't necessarily mean that you're you, you have to have that Creative Commons license or a new license on top of the copyright that the copyright owner has granted in order for it to be considered open educational resource. Everything else is probably just open access. You can use it for free, but you have to be careful because just because you can access it doesn't mean you can, you know, you can access a song on YouTube. That doesn't mean you can go up on stage and start singing it and charging ticket price. So it's Copyright's having a hard time keeping up with the internet, but they're doing the best they can with a bunch of little extra laws. And uh, so, yeah, I just treat, I treat everything as if it's copyrighted unless I see a specific Creative Commons license attached to it. Okay. Okay. That, that's helpful. Um, you know, I know that um, when you find something on the internet that you can have a link to, assuming that it's uh, not posted there illegally. Um, it, then you can share that with your students, but that link could go away. Right. Um, but there are a set of journals that are open access journals. And I, I was under the impression that you could actually share copies of that with your students, not that you could edit it. Um, but, and I'm, I, maybe that's, I'm not a librarian. Um, so I, you know, the idea of the open access was that it could, 
and particularly this comes into play with medical journals where right. you know, there's life-saving the information there. Yeah. That other re medical researchers really need to know uh, and medical practitioners um, so that they can uh, treat people. So um, I was under the impression that those could be copied, but maybe I'm well, wrong. The the open access in that case means that it's free to read. One of the biggest problems with our health and medical and research is that you run into a paywall if it's under like, some place like uh, vendors like EBSCO or uh, ProQuest or Peterson or, you know, there's all these vendors. Sure. They make their money off of licensing access to journal articles. And if you take them out of the loop and you say, okay, well, we're just going to, you know, taxpayer money paid for this research. We think the taxpayer should have free access to it. You're basically saying anybody can access this for free. Now, once you access it, um, I would have to look into exactly the specifics of t whether I think it's it's still considered under copyright. So I'd still treat it under fair use that anybody could have one copy for their own personal, educational, non-commercial use. But I don't think I would be comfortable with making 30 copies of that article. Um, you might, you know, that's pushing the fair law, you might, or fair use, you might be able to do that and hand it out in class and not be in trouble. But yeah, the thing with so copyright I'm law. About, I, yeah, hmm? So, Val, I'm thinking of like public library of science, you know, right. Law, and I'm thinking about nature. I think Val. They were open access. And so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. And I, I mean, it's a great, uh, I, you've given me a different perspective on it. Yeah. You it know, Val, like, though, I think Val, I think that if it's open access in a journal, she probably can copy it and give it to her. My interpretation, Val and I work together. So yeah, this is Catherine. My, uh, Catherine I really Boston. argue about this. I think if it's an open access journal, you could print it off and give it three, 30 copies because basically the grant has already paid for distribution. So that right, and they're not losing the market value. And that's that's kind of the crux of the copyright issue is that you don't want to step on people's toes and keep them from making money off of it. Well, if they've already not, if they already are in a situation where they're not making money off of providing access, then that's not something they can lose by having multiple copies But distributed. in that case, they would be very upset though if you edited it or revised it in any way. Right. Yes. Yeah. And some of these open access, you are allowed to rewrite, you know, but if it's an open access journal, in that case, they're wanting it exactly as it is the day you downloaded it. You know? So in a sense, it's ND. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's a non, it's a, a non, um, oh, whatever the word is. <laughs> so it okay. be an open educational. Yeah, research. it's, Obviously. it's basically, you can, uh, have extra copies as is, but you can't change, edit, add, no, subtract. No, we would get foggy as if the journal had a brilliant illustration, like a fantastic picture of COVID-19. Could you then use it in other purposes? And in that case, you would probably want to write the copyright owner to see if you would get permission, unless it was from a government source. And not, some government sources don't go under that, though, because if the government outsourced it <laughs> to a private but it, vendor, but then it's- it said copyright from the National Library of Medicine or copyright from CDC, then you're probably okay. Yeah, yeah. But that's, why, that's why you'll find a lot of images from the, the um, PubMed in various uh, websites, because they, they can take that. But, but yeah, I think I think that is a big problem with the um, idea of what's the difference between open educational resources and open access. And I think the main thing is the open educational resources have that overlying Creative Commons license that allows you to modify it and do derivatives. The N, the ND, the non-derivative is open access, but you can't do anything with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, is that is that your understanding too, Catherine? Um, I would think so. I will say, though, that on occasion, um, 
I was at the last last month was low vision month. And so um, the uh, National Library, the National Eye Institute had all this publicity about preventing glaucoma and other eye diseases. And they said, use it, mix it, however you want. We're just trying to help save the public site. And, and they had all this stuff that you could put on your website, you could put in social media, wherever you wanted, just to, because they wanted to get the word out. Wonderful. And one thing I wanted to mention, and I, I, Val and Catherine, I know you're aware of this, but the, the US Department of Education, but for folks who might be new, because since this was a beginner uh, webinar, um, the Department of Education passed in 2018, the requirement that almost all of their competitive grants um, require that the materials produced are openly licensed. So, and I think it says CC BY. So it's, that's, so, there'll be less of, you know, government resources that are developed by private industry under a grant that are not openly licensed. So, which is a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. It's a great, it's great. Yeah. Well, I, I, once again, I want to thank Val and Sue today uh, for joining us for this uh, really informative kind of getting started webinar um, on OER and, and attributions. And, and I want to say there's, there's a lot of great stuff going on in Wisconsin um, around OER. And um, I don't know, Catherine or Val, if you wanted to give a shout out to some of the great stuff that's going there, going on there before we um, close off the webinar. Well, we do have uh... A lot of things going on. I have in my handout some information about the uh, Wisconsin Consortium, which we call COWS. Uh, but the main thing is, is that we have an affordability conference up in uh, Menominee. We didn't have it because of pan the pandemic. This Well, we would had it, but not everybody showed up. Um, but I'm looking forward to next year and going to another affordability conference. It'll probably be in March up in Menominee. And that's where we get together with vendors and, and people that provide content and other practitioners and talk about OER and how we can move it forward, get more colleges, more faculty on board and help faculty to move over to OER. One thing about the free textbook, it, it, is, it is a really wonderful thing, but a lot of faculty are nervous because they're used to having a lot of test banks and supplementary material from the publisher in addition to the textbook, and they depend on that to supplement their teaching. And really, it's not as much of a problem as they might think, because in many cases, a textbook that is adopted by more than one university has a, a work group. Uh, on OER Commons, they have groups that get together and they discuss the, the, uh, the textbook and they provide test banks and so forth. They kind of put it all together. So a lot of times those test banks are available out there. And also as a plug for open pedagogy, you can have your students create questions and create the test. And I think that really makes the students dig in and understand the material. If they have to come up with three questions and each question you know, has maybe multiple choice. They have to come up with the right answer, an almost right answer, a wrong answer, and you know, basically all of the above. And the students then, because I had a class that forced us to do that, the Creative Commons licensing class did that, where you had to really know not only what was in the chapter, but you had to come up with a question that could be answered accurately and clearly and yet know enough about it to make a, a question that wasn't quite right, but might trip someone up. So it's, I, I really believe in having students become active parts of the content creation when it comes to supplementary materials. And there's the idea of not having homework that's disposable, but having homework that is then usable in another context. That's a, a wonderful thing. But even if you don't have time or energy to have your students make these supplementary resources, there are a lot of supplementary resources out there. And if you just you know, come up with the concept, uh, 
then you can you can start searching for it and find a lot of different resources to explain that concept or illustrate that concept. Yeah, thank you, Val. Um, Thursday, um, our, our our theme is um, open pedagogy and equity, um, and so um, it's going to be an asynchronous event. But I heard that Friday. Open Oregon is having Robin DeRosa speak on open pedagogy, and that's another free event. Um, if you're on our email list, Liz is sending out all this information. Um, or you can, of course, go directly to the Open Education Week site as well and see all of those things. Because don't forget, there's some really wonderful global events that um, you have an opportunity to attend live. Um, and um, I'm just putting this in for Val because she was answering. But Wisconsin does have a very exciting initiative called OpenRN. It's a $2.5 million grant. And I put it in the chat um, because if you're a nursing instructor, they are already writing um, textbooks or have written textbooks that you can use and others will be coming out soon. Yes, and um, Kim Ernstmeyer, who heads that up at Chippewa Valley, she's presented at uh, multiple events uh, with us, um, which is wonderful. Um, they were one of the Department of Ed, the U.S. Department of Ed grantees in 2019. So thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing that. And it's a wonderful example. They're doing five textbooks. They're, uh, they finished their first one already, and they're in uh, review on the second and third one. Um, and so just they're moving ahead, and it's really exciting to see that. That's great. This is, this is your last chance to catch these experts, Val and Catherine and Sue and, and Liz. You can always email us. <laughs> <laughs> and the recordings will be posted. So, oh. <laughs> Sue, so there is a question in the chat that says, do you know of any initiatives similar to OpenRN specific to anatomy and physiology? Uh, I know there's a lot of... Uh, virtual dissection websites out there. I'm not too sure. I haven't looked into anatomy and physiology in, in particular. I looked up anatomy and physiology for someone recently. There are some uh, OERs that have already been written in that area. Um, I, I can look for them. I don't remember whether they were listed on Merlot or somewhere else. Yeah, it came up at a meeting I was at, which of course, in the last month or two, um, there is definitely some work being done in that area. And I think it might actually be around anti-racism and equity, because um, that's been kind of our focus recently, uh, is finding anatomy and physiology OER textbooks. Of course, OpenStax has one, uh, but that actually represent um, our students and our world and are not strictly all white people. So mm -hmm. um, I know that there is a project going on around that. Um, so, yeah, um, so Marie, you can definitely email us and um, it sounds like any of us could um, share some of that information with you. Oh, I have a question. This is Sophia, if I may, please. Once you have, you, you, you share a textbook, a find the final product, product, once you have the final product, what do you share with the students for them to have access to that textbook, that OER text or materials? Why is it is the link that we find it under or? Uh... Well, ideally you would have a copy in your own institution. The reason I recommend that is because whenever you link out to something, that link can disappear. A you know, right now, open education, you know, like OER Commons is this wonderful website. But at some point, you know, a few years from now, it might merge with another one, or it might close. And so you want to make sure that if your students are depending on that textbook for the semester, you should have a copy of that textbook on a server in your own campus, and then you would link to that. And does that, I mean, you could also 
offer to print some out and sell them in the bookstore or uh, some of them you can uh, click and they'll send you a printout and the cost of printed textbooks is based on just the cost of printing not it's not a profit driven uh, situation and you can send it to FedEx or someplace to get copies printed out because uh, that's that's part of making it accessible. And a lot of times you would just send them a, you'd have, well, what I like to do is I like to have the teacher let me know what they're using and I'll provide links to the textbook and links to supplementary material so that the student has everything they need for the class in one place. But for you, for yourself personally, you could just, you know, have the link in your say Blackboard or Moodle and because it's open educational resource, you could actually upload a PDF if you wanted to, or uh, put sections of it in, in as content in your different pages. Really, you're, you're pretty, um, pretty open to how you want to distribute it, but it's a good idea to have it available so that they can either print it out, read it online, um, or hear it. I mean, that's, that's one thing that doesn't get addressed enough is that to be accessible, it has to be something that can be read by a screen reader and, you know, preferably something that will read it out loud to the student if, if they need that. Thank you so much. I have a question about um, writing, textbook writing initiatives and um, in various disciplines. So I, Karen, I'm assuming, Karen Coughlin, I'm assuming that you're you're looking for some opportunities to get involved with possibly contributing to a textbook. And Sue Tashjian shared the Rebus community there, um, which uh, specifically does um, work on those kind of initiatives of getting groups together to develop OER textbooks and has produced some really wonderful ones. So do check that out. Um, oh, and I wanted to just give you a little tip. It's in the handout, but I might as well just say it that uh, if you're looking for materials on any topic and you want to know what subject librarians have on their library guides about that topic, you can put in your term in Google and then the word site, S-I-T-E, colon, dot, E-D-U, and the word libguides, L-I-B-G-U-I-D-E-S, and that's going to pull up a bunch of library guides written by subject specialists in libraries and then if you look at a few of those you can see that there are some items that you'll find in every guide and i consider that to be peer review if i if i go through 20 guides on anatomy and every single one of them refers to a particular resource then i figure well huh, i want my students to have access to that too so that's that's one way of finding resources based on what other libraries are recommending to their people Could you repeat again, please? What was the extension or link num uh, that you mentioned, please? The the link for what? Uh, the the one you said if we add certain things at the end. Okay, yeah. Here, let me just. I'll just. I'll put it in the. I'll put it in the chat box. Oh, thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okay, make sure I spell everything right and make it easier. Okay, and then get rid of that. Sorry for the time, I'm just stripping out the nonsense out of the URL. Everybody wants to keep track of where we're searching from. So they, I think they put like the latitude into it or something. Okay, so here's an example search. And what that would do is it would look for the words anatomy and OER in educational websites that are, that use LibGuides as a way to make research guides. And so that's, that's something I do a lot of times when I'm, just looking for quick answers about a topic, I'll put in the word libguides 
so that I get into the library research guides that other librarians have created for their for classrooms and faculty. Were there any other questions? All right, well, I hope everyone has a happy open ed week and thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you later in the week or um, at another time online virtually or when we can all be in person again. Thank you. Thank you.